Hello, everyone. This is Ed Brenniger, and this is the Eddie Network Podcast. This is a special edition and decided to do this after an experience I had recently with a group in Australia. About that in a minute. Today is Thanksgiving here in the U.S., and it's a day of thanks that is usually filled with all kinds of hurriedness and people gathering and fine deep eating of turkeys and all, all these things. And the the importance of Thanksgiving gets lost in that. Uh, I published yesterday a, a substack piece on the five actions of gratitude. They are say thanks, give back, make welcome, honor others and create goodness. And in, and in telling you that, if you if you align your life in the, with actions of those five actions of gratitude, I believe you'll find your life full of peace and joy and um, less anxiety, and you'll find that your life has real meaning. Those are the five actions of gratitude. What I also want to show you today is how people online can express gratitude, and I'm. I'm showing a video that is a conversation that I had with a group in Australia called the Catalyst Network, which is led by Josie Gibson, who has been a guest on the Eddie Network podcast. And as she uh, introduces the, the, the time that we have together, I was really taken by um, her appreciation for me. And, I, and so this is, Really about Josie and her people, not about me, but really about how you can express this to people. And that's what I'd like for other people to experience is the, that kind of appreciation when, when you don't know that you are even worthy of appreciation and when they give it to you, it's really quite special. So here, here is our conversation. And I uh, thank you for watching the Eddie Network, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Today, though, we're going to go to the heart of what it means to be a catalyst, an outlier, somebody who sees and experiences the world differently from your family, your peers, perhaps even those you're closest to. And what might you do with that realisation, that truth, once it dawns? It's not an easy path, as we know. Um, Many of you on this call will remember Richard Martin and Kenneth Mickelson and their, their marvellous book, The Neo-Generalist. Um, Richard and Kenneth joined us to speak about their research um, soon after they published their book in 2016, which just seems like a lifetime ago now. Um, I think they landed on a dilemma that's just so familiar to people on this call, um, and they captured it in these two questions. Have you ever encountered difficulties describing what you do to other people? And have you ever labelled yourself in order to be understood? Mm. Um, that's our lives, right? Our daily lives. So the neo-generalist, the book, um, explores the notion of the outlier who constantly moves along that continuum from expert or hyper-specialism to generalist. Um, quote, uh, a restless multi multidisciplinarian who's forever learning, unquote. I love that. Kenneth and Richard um, identified common neo-generalist um, characteristics and behaviours like bringing people together um, from diverse backgrounds, um, synthesising wildly different ideas and practices and addressing the big issues that confront us in order to shape a better future. And, of course, I know that that will resonate with you all. Um, and that captures the essence of today's guest, Ed Brenegar's life and work and experiences as a leadership consultant, um, minister, traveller and change agent. Um, Richard and Kenneth interviewed Ed uh, many years ago now Ed, um, as part of their book research and elegantly documented um, Ed's calling to help people around the world realise their potential. Um, for much of his life, Ed has operated at the intersection of something, of many things, I think, um, disciplines, um, peoples, communities, geographies, a true um, boundary spanner, um, border, border inhabitant, um, weaving connections that reflect his curiosity and, and 
empathy and humanistic approach. Um, Ed, just as you're here, has this um, incredible ability to connect with people from all walks of life about all things and what matters to them most with great and, and genuine humility. And conversation being Ed's favoured mode of operating, um, I thought we might open this session with a few initial um, probing inquiries from me and then we'll open it up and see where the conversation needs to go. Um, so Ed, to, to kick off with, um, you're quoted as saying, everywhere I go is home. What, what, what does that mean? Well, thank you, Josie, for having me here. I feel like I need to say nothing after your introduction because I, I just I don't want to dispel anything that you've said as uh, being untrue, but I appreciate that very much. I'm, I'm very honored by, by your thoughts and um, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I just, um, the way I see that, um, I'm interested in people and I'm curious about the, their lives. And, I'm, and I know that everybody lives within a context of, of, of a place that they live, you know, with their families, with their coworkers, with their neighbors. And so um, I have, you know, I, I know I said that, but I don't know if I've ever been very intentional about, about that. I don't, I don't see the places that I go as becoming my home. I see it as someone else's home and I want to understand it. And, um, and I, and I didn't realize this until more recently over the la you know, last year or so that so much of my travels I've been, I've been on, um, I've gone by myself without anyone else. And so I, I show up in, in Africa as this lone old white man who's surrounded by all these dark faces who are welcoming me and they're, and they're including me to their families and to their community. And, and I, I'm not referencing anything from my background or if I was with a group, I'm not, we're not talking about how we're in comparing comparing ourselves to them. I'm simply looking at what they live and saying, um, this is this is a beautiful thing. I, I'll, I'll give you one example. There's a, a group in, in Kenya that I work with called Empowering Lives International. And, and the project that I work in is rural economic development. I do, I lead, I do leadership development of their coordinators that exist in 25 countries across Africa. And the fellow that heads this program is a guy named Isaac. And uh, when I was there in February of 2020, he, he took me out to meet some women who are in the program. And after we had, and, um, and they're the, the first episode of my podcast and where we talk, with, I talk with the women about um, their learning how to raise chickens as an economic um, enterprise. And but after we had been there, uh, we know we went over to uh, Isaac's home. There's a little farm for dinner, and we were walking around the farm. And he pointed over to the side of a field, and he says, "This is where I'm going to build you a Nandi hut, so that you will always have a home when you come to Africa." I don't think anything else needs to be said when you're. You are welcomed to be a part of their community in such a demonstrative way. Now, he hasn't built the hut, and I haven't been back since then, but I know that he he meant that sincerely, and and one one day it may be that that's exactly what happens. So it's it's um, it, it's not about projecting ourselves into their situation, but rather being patient to listen and to observe and, and see what, what, is, what is it that I can learn from what they're doing and how, they're, how they relate to one another. Right. Okay, cast your mind back, Ed, to Ed as a 21-year-old. How did you describe yourself then compared with how you would describe yourself now? Oh, my. At 21, 
um, I was just finishing my university education and I, I did not fit into that world because uh, I remember my first first semester, uh, I was in a, there was a history course, a literature course, a religion course, um, a freshman English course, I think, and there was a, some other course. And I, and I was, I'm sitting in, in these courses and I said, this is all too narrow. How, how am I going to read this dense stuff? I, I don't, I don't read that fast. I, I read to learn, but I, how can I read all these books um, in all these classes? And, and so I had a hard time my first two years because I, I tended to not do all that work. Um, I was just ill suited to that and set up, hung out with people. And when it became clear that I was, if I continued in that path, I'd flunk out of, uh, out of school. I, I changed and I felt some discipline, but I, I became a, a, um, an American studies major, which allowed me to study whatever I wanted to from a wide range of things. So I, I took a, um, an anthropology course where for the first time I learned um, Gregory Bateson's um, uh, systems theory. I took uh, two courses in African-American literature. I took, you know, uh, I took art courses. I took things that I thought would, were, that were interesting to me. And when I graduated, I didn't have a clue as to what I was going to do. So I ended up going into ministry because ministry was also this kind of broad, expansive thing. So you're going to meet all kinds of people and you need to have a wide range of knowledge in order to be effective in doing that. And I think without really knowing that, that's how I ended up doing ministry for really the first um, 10, 13 years after I finished university. So I was a neo-generalist before I knew that there was a term. How and, did you um, respond when, um, when you were having the conversations with Kenneth and Richard around that term? How did that make you feel? to have a term? Well, I had never thought of myself in those terms. And, what, and what's interesting is that um, in January of this year, uh, Barbara Cleve, who is a, a coach in, in Switzerland who works with um, polymaths, she reached out to me and she says, I, you know, I'm re reading your stuff. I think you're a polymath. I said, really? You know, I, I, you know, I just didn't, I didn't see myself categorized. I don't see myself categorized in any way. I don't like labels because I think they marginalize us. But um, I, I said, okay, well, that's that's interesting. It didn't become something where I felt that it was now a program or a, um, a, a purpose. Um, my purpose was always, I'm going to learn, I'm going to learn from all kinds of different things. And as it developed, I'm going to learn so I can have better inter interactions with people so that I know enough about their world so I can have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, not fitting in, the, the outlier concept, the, 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 the idea of being a misfit. What does that mean in practice? What are the upsides of that and what, what are some of the downsides that you've experienced? Uh, two things. One is that I have the privilege of meeting a wide spectrum of people and I can meet them without there being a sense that I have to, to be like them or they have to be like me. We can just be in, in relationship where we learn from each other. Um, and not feeling that I fit in, I didn't realize... I mean, I've realized that all along. And, and the kind of the thing is, well, how do you fit in when you don't fit in? How do you fit in when you're an outsider? And I, I began to realize that the insiders are living in a kind of a closed system. And, and that's not necessarily a best, the best thing. But I didn't realize the, the effect of that until this past, this past winter when I went to the 
memorial service for a, a friend who I'd gone to high school with. And he had gone to college and come back to the town. And become, he, was an, uh, he was an accountant. And he had, he had stayed there ever since we had finished college. So we're talking now almost uh, 50 years. And um, it was in their little, their little independent church. And the pastor gets up and he says a prayer and he says, okay, who wants to come up and say something about Buzz? And 90 minutes later, he finally steps up and says, well, I think we have explored Buzz's life and his effect upon us pretty well. And what people were saying was, Buzz was this guy that he was always there for us. When I needed him, I could go knock on his door and he would help me. And what I realized, what I realized was how important it is for people to have roots in a community. And when you're rooted in a community, you have a chance to have an impact upon that community in a way that people like me will never have. And I, and I felt a sense of loss that I had never really established myself in a community that had lasted for more than, the, my, the community that I'd been in the longest lasted about 20 years. But even when I left that, it, it didn't follow me when I left. So that, that difference between being the vagabond, the stranger, the wanderer, the, as, um, as the, you know, in Celtic lore, the freeborn man, uh, being that person rather than the person who always stays and always is there to to be the caretaker of their community, to build to build those kinds of sustainable strengths in a community, um, it was really very clear to me that the distinction between the two. Mm. But that you know, as you, as you know, through the, the the explorations you've done through history, those outsiders have played an important role in highlighting truths within communities haven't they has that yes, been your have. experience yes and that's that's increasingly my experience um and um yeah i'll just say it's increasingly my experience because people increasingly because of the crisis that we are experiencing in the world need an outsider's perspective to act as a check and act as an affirmer affirmation on their own perception of what's happening. Mm. I'm going to open it up to people to jump on. I, I don't want to dominate. I, I've got a lot more questions, but I'm going to encourage you while we have Ed to, to jump on. It's a small group. So, so please just jump on. If you've got a question, any questions, any questions fair game or comments, so. go for it. I've got I've got one that just randomly pops out. Are you talking about being like an outlier and and not fitting in? And you know that's I think Josie said that's how we're all feeling and neo generalist like all those terms. And I've found to the last couple of years, um, and a lot of credit to the people I've been meeting globally, to be honest, that I'm I'm not weird, but I felt most of the time like I'm wrong. And that's a really heavy burden to live with that you're like you're wrong you look out and you go i'm wrong i must have missed something um rather than actually i'm not right but i'm okay why, why do you why do you feel that you're wrong um mostly a lot of uh perspectives from around me people think of you know they'll say oh you're weird or i don't know you can't stick at things they're quite a bit derogatory oh. put mm -hmm. you down that sort of thing so you you're always you're always on the back foot thinking that, yeah, that you're, I guess the best way to say it is that you're, that you're wrong, that I'm wrong, being like that. Well, I, I would see that what you have is a strength of character of where you can stand apart mm -hmm. and see things maybe in an objective way that they can't. And that many of the people within that circle are in that circle because they do not have that strength of, of um, personal identity where they can say i i can objectively look at my group and and be critical of it in the in a gentle and loving way but I'd still be critical and and um so they end up going end up complying with everything that gets said and thrust upon them yeah. trish you reminded me of uh, a quote um you know kate miller heidke who is that beautifully quirky 
singer and she was a Eurovision um, representative and she met Cindy Lauper a few years ago and she said pretty much what you said to Cindy Lauper she said everybody thinks I'm weird and Cindy Lauper said look at me she said just just keep being weird because there's enough of everything else out there so I reckon embrace like your weirdness that. weirdness is good look what look, look what it gives the world yeah Stephen I can see your hand, but not your face. Hi, I'm off. I'm off camera um, today, but um, the I love the topic and I love the name, the phrase. Um, so thanks for the thanks for setting us up, and I'd like to hear your story, Ed. One of the things, and I think I recognise, I can recognise some elements um, in myself. One of the things I'm wondering about if you have thoughts around the sort of multi uh, sort of doing multiple things at the same time versus focus and how that can be a bane if you're a neo-generalist that you kind of have so many plates spinning and yet most of the, a lot of the productivity discussion is about how we need to really dive deep and focus and have un, you know, uninterrupted um, time. So it's sort of uh, just sort of generally the, the practical how-tos, I guess, is sort of what I'm interested in. Well, um... It is tough to juggle all of that. So, okay, let's just admit that. All right. So, so that's, that's a reality. Okay. Is it a reality that we should jettison? No, I don't think it should be. Cause I think what, what we, we as neo-generalists or polymaths or whatever you want to call it, what we do that other people are not so inclined to do is is integrate different areas of thought and action so that there's something more holistic that results and that's that to me is a is a really important thing we need we need people who who can walk into situations and be able to to see the different pieces that are there and to integrate them into something that makes sense and so it affirms that the different let's say the different gifts within a within a team you know instead of it all being about one type of person um i can tell you that the the greatest challenge that i have is um what to do with all the books that i bought over the years <laughs> and and i i tend to buy books when i hear hear of something i don't know about um a new a new idea and um and i want to learn enough about that and so in case i meet someone who is say in that field of work or study i have something um something to say that is um not just intelligent but more more importantly it um demonstrates a respect for them and i'll, I'll give you an example um I, I interviewed uh, Ola uh, Folk Kirkby on my podcast back in the summer, and he's a, a Danish philosopher, and he's known for the, an idea called the event or the event, eventium. Uh, and not that we have to go into that, but um, I had uh, he um, Kenneth Mickelson is writing his biography, and Kenneth had connected me, and Kenneth um told me a little bit about Ola and he says in this and that's this idea of the eventium is his is kind of his thing that is he's most well known for and so I had to go so I bought a couple of his books and I had to dig dig into it and it took me a while to kind of come to understand what he was saying and then if you watch that video you'll see me make a comment during the during the middle of that interview, where I, I mentioned what I see that the eventium being, and the and the look of pleasure on his face was made the whole thing worthwhile. So that's the way I, I come at this, this having to take on lots of different things in order to now that's that's kind of on a knowledge level. Is it a, can you do it at the level of work? Um, I think it's more difficult there because work requires a singular focus in many respects. So I think it comes back to, so what is it that we want to achieve? What is it, what is the impact we want to have? If we're going to be this, if we're going to be this kind of person, what is the impact we want to have? 
and then um, focus on that and be willing to let go of some of the things that may be of interest and maybe it brings us enjoyment, but they are not going to take us in that direction. Right, makes sense, thank you. Thank you. Um, I might jump in. Um, hey, Ed, I'm Tom, nice to meet you. Good to see you. you thank you. The story so far. Um, question for me is you mentioned earlier around that sort of patience to observe and sort of be and sort of let what's going on inform then the response. Um, and, I, and I was curious on your experience uh, in just sort of general day-to-day -day life, uh, various workplaces, you know, Western society in general, I'd say, is almost like an impatience that I feel like I encounter a lot where people just kind of want the answer. They want the simple answer. They want the short answer. They want the easy answer. And they want you to say with confidence and assertiveness so that, you know, people trust you and go with that direction um, or whatever. But But in my experience, it's almost always more valuable to almost s slow down to speed up and have that kind of time to observe and be patient and then let almost let the the best thing emerge out of the observation and the time um and then that's where you get the stuff that really has impact and really creates magic and really you know has people have those moments where they're like wow what was that um but almost there seems to me almost like a skill in creating the opportunity to have the space to observe. And I was curious about how you may do that. I, um, I don't I understand what I, I'm giving you a, um, not so much a theory, but a practice that I do. Um, but the waiting is not to figure out what to say. I'm I'm really listening to be triggered by some something that raises a question that I then I can ask. Um, so if, I'll give you an example. So I was sitting in a bar here a couple of weeks ago, here in um, this town in Wyoming, and I'm in for a couple of months. And um, the the bartender, this young woman, comes over and. And um, and I, I, I don't remember how we got in the conversation, but I asked her. Um, I asked her. Uh, I asked her how old she was. She said she was thirty eight. I said, so how long have you lived here? Well, I, I grew up here, and then I left in when I was twenty six and went to New York, and I was there for for eight years. And I and I said, so why did you? So why did you go to New York? She says, I wanted, I thought I would go and find people who would be um, interesting and, and I could have conversations and it would expand my life. And, and I said, well, that, did that happen? She says, no, not really. And, I, and she said that with some disappointment. And I said, but what did you find when you were there? See, that's, so, so she raised the question of something that was lacking so what I wanted to find out was, what did you find? If you didn't find what you're looking for, what did you find? And, and then she told me about some things that she had come to read and, and uh, there were things that I had read. And so we could, I, could, I could ask her more questions about that. And, um, and so we now, I've gone in there probably three or four times a week for the last month and I've had conversations with her, very intelligent conversations. And um, and and I've you know, found out more about her, and I found that she didn't she didn't go to college, and yet she's a very intelligent person. So what I'm what I'm learning is that everybody has something that's interesting to say, and and the people who are the most interesting are probably the people who are the least. Um, thought of as interesting by the general public. And so the, I have spent more time over the last three years talking to people who have no higher education experience. Um, I have friend, a friend who is a um, heavy equipment operator and his wife has a, um, a house cleaning business. 
And she listens to all my podcast and she comments on the podcast. And he he is extraordinarily bright, but he has no interest in abstractions. And so he tells stories about his family and about the community where he grew up. So I think that maybe the way to, I, I'm processing your question as I'm, I'm rambling here. I think maybe the way to, to look at this is to try to understand what their life is like rather than what they think. And if we can understand what their life is like, then, then we will find it fitting into some kind of conceptual idea that we've already had, but now we understand them better and we can talk to them at a, at a level of, of um, respect and dignity that maybe we don't really have the opportunity to um, ordinarily. How does that resonate, Tom? Yeah, it's um, there's something that the the idea that you're actually it's not about just sort of endlessly observing either. It's actually the intention of the way you open up the space is by asking a good question <laughs> at the right in the in it's at, that's sort of getting to the thing that's deeper and more valuable or more useful. And I think that's the bit that often is the the hard part is almost slowing down to listen properly to get to find the trigger for the good question. That's cool. Like that. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. But that releases an energy. I mean, to your point, Tom, um, you know, everybody in the catalyst community and probably across the neo generalist um, family, it, it is around uh, forward energy, I suppose. I don't want to use the term progress, but it is not just sitting around doing the kumbaya stuff. There, there is some intentionality behind it, whether it's at work or in a family or in a community, um, and how we kind of release that energy or tap into it is part of, I mean, I've seen you do it, um, but there's a process trap, isn't there? Well, it's just, uh, for me, the, the origin of that question for me is um, it's almost like a, I don't particularly like being the expert with the answer. <laughs> but I often feel like I'm pressured to be that or have that kind of voice. And I always kind of feel like whenever you be that, you somehow shut down what might be there that you don't yet know about. And so there's this tendency in me to want to almost not bring that to the table, but then I often get feedback that I need to be more like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I think it's uh, the worst thing to be called as an expert. Because it means you've already learned what you need to learn. And, and, and I can tell you that's certainly not the case. And um, and I think you can tell people that, well, don't, I'm not an expert. I'm still learning. I'm a learner. You know, I'm trying to figure this out. Well, so what do you think? What, what do I need to learn from you? I mean, that's, and that affirmation of per, a person when you say, what do I, what can I learn from you? Tell me about your experience. It's, I think it's such an important, important thing. I, um, yeah. Yeah, thank but, you. So, Ed, do, you know, you've spent a lot of time in different parts of the world. Do you think that spending time with cultures where uh, listening in a different way and collective endeavours are more um, part of the social fabric has helped you... Uh, be more effective in a sort of typically Western context. Oh, there it goes. So I don't know how to turn that off, by the way, but you I just like got, that. it was no just, just for you, Ed. Thank but, you. But you know, sort of a synthesis of things that are there right in front of us of, over many millennia, weaving that into how we do stuff together today. Yeah, I, th I think I think the challenge if you're a traveler, the challenge is always how to overcome the impression that you're just a tourist. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give you I'll give you an example of how you can do that. So in 2017, uh, I went for the first time to the Peter Drucker Global Forum in Vienna, and um, it it was a great experience. And I was around a lot of corporate people that I've never around. I'm not a corporate guy, so I'm on the outside of the corporate world. And um, though I'm looking in and I'm 
I have my opinions. And so I'm, st I'm standing at a high top table eating lunch on Friday to with talking with this guy from England. And these two high school girls walk up to us and they just want to, and they're, and they're from a, a high school there in Vienna. It's a business high school. You know, they're teaching business principles. And, um, and so they start talking to us and asking about the conference and they're, you know, they're telling us why they're there. And I say, I'm going to be here all next week. Why don't you invite me to come over to your school and talk about leadership? I mean, I, I mean, I was, it was a ridic ridiculous, you know, enorm and it, this would never happen in America. This would, we may be the land of the free, but we're not free in that regard. And, and so she says, oh, that sounds great. So she gets on the phone. She calls the teacher who's somewhere else in the building. And the teacher calls the headmaster. And the headmaster says, well, if you think it's okay. And so I show up on Monday at 9 o'clock at their high school. And they um, take me to a, a class where they're learning, um, uh, to, they're learning uh, how to do uh, businesses online. And then I go and I speak to about 100, 125 students and in, in faculty in the library. And um, so I'm just this stranger who, who just in typical American fashion kind of bullies his way gently into their midst. And uh, I talk a bit, and I talk with the students about the impact they can have and, and how they can see that if they, if they live to 100, like many of us can, can imagine now, what, what their life would have been like and what they could say about their life if they lived a life of impact. And so, um, and, and some of those students maintained some connection with me over the next year, which is, um, so I, I think it's that the idea is that wherever we go, um, there are people who are, who are will welcome us into their fellowship, into their friendship, into their community, and that we just have to go with openness and a and a, a confidence, but a gentle a gentle confidence that we have something to offer, but it's not it's more of something to contribute that uh, than simply something that we demand of them, and um, and it and it has to be and it has to be oriented around what is it, what is, how is this going to benefit them? And it's really not about our ego. Mm. Thank you. Helena, do you want to jump on and ask your question? You don't have to turn your camera on. No? So the, the, the comment or the question from Kalina, Ed, is um, there's a beautiful, listening to Ed, there's a beautiful opportunity and calling for generalists to help stitch together the people, heart, knowledge, compassion and kindness to navigate our global and local ecosystems to meet the chaos differently than we have before. Holding the space. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And... I think it happens from the ground up. It has to. It has to be a. It has to begin with a grassroots um, effort. I um, one of the things that I learned as a consultant. I mean, you, when you're a consultant and you're not really gifted to be a consultant. I mean, you just you call yourself <laughs> a consultant, but you just what you do is you're talking your way into groups and to kind of figure out what's going on and see if you can offer some help. Um, when I, when I started as a consultant, I'd never been a consultant, never run a business. And I just knew how to talk to people and I knew how to solve problems. And my 10 year old son at the time, who's now 38 said, when I asked, what, what do I do? He said, dad talks people into off, talks people into having problems, offers to fix them. <laughs> well, that, that turned out to be really true. And, and so I'm, I'm observing what's going on in these places. And one of the things I observed and this is a, it's a long phrase, but I'll explain it. What I what I came to see is that there is a persistent, residual culture of values in in communities and in businesses and organizations. Actually, a persistent residual culture of values that persists 
because it resides in the relationships of the people. And when we see that, and the thing is that culture of values which unite people together, that holds them together, where they, it's shared values, and with that shared values comes respect and trust that builds that, uh, that continuity and that, that strength of community. I think that's where we begin because things that, because that's, that's happening where we have direct interaction with one another. And the problem with, with global issues is that we don't have direct interaction with the people who are causing these great global crises. And, and th though I would suggest that the people at the top of the performance hierarchies would like us to think that we can have that effect, when I actually I think the effect that we have is in building resilience at the bottom of society so that society can withstand the crisis that is being visited upon us. And, uh, and over time, I think what happens is that the society changes because of the things that we begin to learn how to do, which cause communities to strengthen and cause communities to find sustainable solutions. Those ideas begin to go, go up through the, the system to become acknowledged solutions for, for nations or regions or, or the world. And, uh, and so I, I'm, I'm a, I'm a contrarian in this in that I don't I don't see that um, the that we save things by starting at the top. I think we save things by through our own relationships in, in our communities. And, and and oftentimes that means that we end up resisting what is out there because we we can see in our interaction with one another that this is only going to bring hardship to the people. So I, I look at I, you know my language is, all crises are local and we should treat them as local crises. So Gaza is a local crisis. Ukraine is a local crisis. Um, and, and though, you know, our government here in America would like us to see Ukraine as this, this mythic crisis of good and evil between the West and, and Russia, it's really a, it's a, it's a crisis of, of people for the people on the ground in Ukraine who are the victims of this power game that's going on at the at the upper reaches of of, of the world society. So um, th that's probably a a uh, well, I don't know how you would you greet that, but that's what I've seen. and I, and I see that by having traveled a lot in the world, and I see how what what happens if when governments speak about certain things, as, and you have a relationship with the people there, and you see how it affects them, then you realize that um, there's this there's this there's this divide between the powerful and the powerless. I mean, and that's an old that's an old thing, but there it really truly exists. And I think that if we can build relationships with people who are um, powerless but not in the sense that they need us they need to be dependent upon us rather what we need to do is help them do what we what we do is which is that we learned how to be self-sufficient and interdependent with one another so that when it, when we when i say that there's a persistent residual culture of values that persists because of the relationships of the people that becomes true of what happens in places like uganda where i have an ongoing relationship with a a pastor there who's in a very poor community, and you know during this during the the first year of the of the pandemic, and he was he was writing me, he was texting me on um, WhatsApp, telling me about the people in his church who were dying from starvation, wanting to know what do I do about that, and so and they were dying of starvation because of the essentially because the government had locked down everybody in the country, so they couldn't really move. And, and I said, so I told him, go to your local elected officials and tell him, if you get, if you get the food, we'll distribute it. And he did that. He went and he, he found that, whatever that is, a mayor or whatever that person is, and that mayor found him food and they distributed to his people. But it was a one-off sort of thing. And so it didn't, it didn't last. 
So, so that's my perception of the way these global crises go, is that we really need to treat them as, the, as local crises and, and look out your front door or your back door or your side window and, and say, what's going on here that I can have a tangible hands-on effect to, to create resilience or sustainability or progress or whatever it is that, whatever term ends up being the way to describe what we're, what we're doing. Brilliant. That sounds very much like the way you operate, Margie. I'm not, I'm not actually sure. And I think that, you know, one of the questions I was really struck by what Trish said at the beginning and this idea that, you know, we can look out at others and feel like it's easy to know who they are very quickly, like your friend at the memorial service, um, Ed, whose life could be summed up in 90 minutes. And mm -hmm. we look at ourselves and we struggle to understand who uh, we are and what mm -hmm. we bring to the world. And I think I was, as I was listening, I was just, you know, we're flooding with different think ideas and thinking, but... I very much relate to what Trish said at the beginning because I feel like people look at you oddly or people look confused or, you know, there's there's that thing that causes you to feel like you don't really know what you're doing and you don't really know what you think and bring. And then there's a story that you told, Ed, about going to the Drucker, I think, meeting and... Mm -hmm. And being able to say to the high school students, well, effectively, I think what you were saying was, well, I'm an expert in leadership. Therefore, I can come to you and talk about leadership. So in a way, it's a very difficult sell, if that's the word, to say I'm a generalist because a generalist is anything and could be anyone and um, may not you know, it's not a label you can sell as offering value. Um, I was also thinking about how the UK civil service for for so long really prized generalism that it mm. essentially wouldn't employ. Specialists were looked down upon as being like um, task oriented or, or narrow minded. And what they would always be seeking are people that could approach any issue or any challenge with the tools um, around that. And um, so there's that thing of, well, generalism isn't a new concept because it was highly valued in the UK civil service, but then it's also led oh. the UK civil service to be full of people who are rather abstracted from the experience, because of the structure of government being at national and local, there's a big um, gap between the people that work at the, um, UK central civil service and the lives of people that they're overseeing, they can be rather academic in their approach. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like it's, it's very, what we're talking about is we always, well, I always end up back at this idea of complexity because it sort of feels like how much do we really know about anything or anyone? And I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'm offering you nothing. <laughs> let me respond with a couple of things. First of all, if um, I encourage you to read the Neo Journalist, and one of the things that they will say in there is yeah. that every Neo Generalist should have something that they're specialized in. <laughs> and it doesn't mean it, so the Neo Generalist is someone who is has a broad interest in has an interest in a broad range of of things, but they have something that they specialize in because this may be where their natural talent is or something like that. So I think there is that. Um, I think the prop, you know, it, it comes back to, for me, it comes back to um, how do we, how do we in a very complex world um, have uh, a direct impact upon people and direct impact uh, with a direct relationship where we're, we're connected to people and don't have an answer to that. I just believe that if we focus on building re relationships that have a direct effect upon us, where we care for each other in a in a 
in a real way and that we don't treat each other as um as uh, representations of some social or political ideology that we will have a better chance of solving problems because we will figure out that we need each other to solve these problems um so that's so the specialist that has direct relationships with people i think is going to have a, a, a tremendous positive impact upon people but if they're a specialist and it's all in the abstract you know all in the you know then it's 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 going to be more difficult for for us to actually see the the effect that they're having in a positive way i mean it's an interesting t sort of tension that you both touched on that i've thought about a lot and you know expert is a label but there is something around sticking at something for long enough to learn what learning's about mm -hmm. and i sort of see generationally that you know with shorter attention spans and um a lack of focus it's harder now perhaps for some younger people to stick at stuff for long enough to mm -hmm. have some of those bruises and really the insights that you get when you learn that you know nothing you know that that like the more you learn the the less you know kind of thing so, but I is that expertise I, I don't know I'm these labels are pretty scary aren't they yeah well I would I would suggest you go out and just build relationships with young people and then then if you have a something that you specialize in that can benefit then that's great but if yeah. you don't it's okay because you'll you'll figure out something that you'll need you'll both need and maybe you can work on those together uh, it, you know so it, 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 you know i hate to oversimplify it but it, i think it a lot of this comes back to how do we how do we build relationships with people who um we don't know at this point but can know and maybe out of that can come something which has a lasting benefit to our community mm. I, I don't have a question can can you hear me properly yep yeah yep. just a comment or just all these thoughts that I'm thinking picking up on what Trish said and what you said Ed and a bit of everything but it that your comment at the beginning around home and your response to that question just really sticks with me because and sort of this idea of not being like wanting to be labeled but or what others wanting to label you and do you fit in that box and it seems to me that the space that we tend to exhibit or like exist in or have it and actually we need to hold and create and become welcoming is the space in between so it's through relationships and mm -hmm. and so as individuals we need to kind of own and and feel at home in between mm -hmm. and then make that a space that other people want to come into because it's in between you know that mm -hmm. where things happen so I think yeah just I don't know that's a bit of a ramble but and I think for, no, like I, I think about I think myself, it's very precise I yeah. think it's very precise and, and clear I, I think that space between us there's a space between each one of us right here and that we don't own it as a personal ownership we sh we share that ownership together and we try to figure out how do we how do we bridge that space and live in that space and um and when when like like here we are you know from different places that's a difficult thing to do but but to me that's the beautiful challenge of 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 the of this technology that we have is that we can build the those kinds of relationships where that space um exists for us and something that we share and we can we we cross that by by showing that we do care yeah mm -hmm. thank um, you thank you for raising that question because yeah. i think it's really really important julie is that how you get things done in a really complex environment I was actually reflecting on the conversations I have with young people and they're just amazing. And they they talk about the spaces, they talk about the the in-between, they they want 
they want to interrogate the world really openly and I just love love talking to them not just not just my own if you challenge me quite correctly but it's just Mm -hmm. yeah I, I, I have great hope for this generation just the conversations that I'm seeing and the the generosity and the compassion um that's what that's what I was just thinking about I agree with you yeah Mm. Donna Lee if you're around do you want to jump on there you are Um, (laughs) I'm on my phone it's a little bit um strange so um yeah amazing conversation and um Ed the piece that I'm curious about is um as somebody who's a traveller and an outlier and um, and bringing, you mentioned something about bringing truth to communities when they're kind of complete and you enter that space and then you bring truth. Um, you know, that's a catalyst kind of thing, isn't it? So, um, and, and as somebody who has been in spaces that the truth isn't is can be shocking it can not be well received it can be rejected how do you navigate that well I'll give you an example I am uh, one of the things I'm doing while I'm here in Wyoming is working with a, a couple of churches in a town about a half hour from here who are talking about merging and I, I, I met with uh, groups from both churches last Saturday, you know, and the idea of merger goes to the issue of structure, business structure, and in particular it goes to the issue of what do we do with our buildings? And so that is the obstacle to the merger. And I, and I said to them, I don't think this is it. I don't think it's effective to, for you to think of this as a merger. I think instead you should see that what you are going to create is a blended family and you will become one family who brings different experiences to to the family, but you will work as one unified family in the future. And and that you could see the the tension in the room dissipate because all of a sudden the right metaphor was was applied to that. So I think it's it's a story, but it's a, it's a way of describing what's going on so that it's not confrontational and it's not mechanical. I think that's that's a major part of why we end up in with problems in in uh, interaction within organizations. we we tend to move to the mechanical. and um, so. Yeah, Ed, that's interesting because my um, piece is that we just put Western and business over corporate overlays on everything. You know, in Australia, we've just had a referendum on the, um, you know, Indigenous rights, etc. And again, you know, going through and everything has to have a corporate overlay. It's like, well, can it be done differently? So thank you for that response. That makes so much sense. Hmm. Yeah, looking looking for the human side of things. I, you know, another way of, I've I've approached this is you know I'll somebody will be in a group and somebody will have this this hard, outlandish, very belligerent kind of um, perspective. They and, they and I'll just simply said, "Where did you get that idea?" Mm-hmm. And I'll persist in asking, "Where did that come from?" How did you come to have that perspective on this situation? And oftentimes they have no idea. It's come from some other place. So once they become self-critical about their own positions, then I think you have a chance to begin to um, find some common ground for for more discussion. Mm. So I'm very conscious of time and we're going to have to get you back, Ed, clearly. Um, But just one final question or point of exploration. How do you relate to the future? What does the future mean for you? Is there such a thing? Oh, there is a future. Oh, there is definitely a future out there. Um, I see the the future as un undefined um 
but I'm looking at trends. I I um, I see that um, the future will be much more communal, much more network oriented. I think that the the business structures that we have, which were born in during the industrial era, are um, unsustainable. And our Christ, uh, all our crises, all the crises that we're facing, are are basically because it's an attempt by those who are in power to hold on to a past that no longer exists. And so when we begin to talk about how we relate to one another through networks of relationships and how we build um, relationships of respect and trust and mutual accountability and because we we have shared values, I think then we have a begin to, the beginning of what the future could be. I think it's emergent. I think it's emergent, meaning we don't know what it's going to look like. Um, but, you know, I'm, I, I turned 70 this year, but I'm planning to live to 105. And I, <laughs> Good on I, you. Well, I got genetics in my favor because of my family. But I, I look at that because I'm looking at the next 30 years as a, a very difficult time, but also a very positive revolutionary time. And that we're going to see the emergence of things that all the experts and all the people who are in power cannot imagine because they are so so captivated by the past that they can't imagine any anything being other than what they have known up to this point. Wow, what, what a fabulous, um, inspiring finale to a great conversation, Ed. Thank you. I mean, you've Thank just you. swept swept us up into that vision, um, which I think we all, on some level, we can we can feel that happening. Um, and these sorts of conversations. And if you haven't checked out Ed's podcast, please do and and reach out to Ed. Um, the weaving of connections with different people around the world uh, is immensely powerful. Um, so I think you can see why I was so keen. Um, to invite Ed along to have a chat with us, the the deep humility and curiosity and breadth of of knowledge and wisdom, but above all the graciousness that you show, Ed. It's you know how we how we embody ourselves during this period, this transition period that that you just described, that I think is so important. And you've just shown us how how to to live that and I'm not sure about 105 but I reckon got a few more runs on the board so thank you so much for making the time um and please join me in thanking Ed for um speaking to the Catalyst Network yay thank, thank you Ed. thank you, you Josie Thanks, thank Ed. you so much and um I'll send you a link Ed because there's some Wonderful. great chat in there and um we look forward to the next time so enjoy um Wyoming in the oh. fall Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Thank everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.